Hello students, my name is Peace Bay Victor Comba from the Faculty of Science, Technology and Environmental Studies. I am the course instructor of OEV 107 General Biology. So this video will cover knowledge area 6 and we will discuss the introduction to cell biology but also it will focus on the bacteria, virus, fungi, but also we will discuss the genetics. So let's begin with the first part, the introduction of cell, introduction to cell biology. Types of cells. Based on the structural organization, cells can be divided into two groups. The first one is prokaryotic cell, which is found in bacteria, and that's why all bacteria are called prokaryotes. Also, prokaryotic cell is found in blue and green algae, but also in microplasma. Another group is eukaryotic cells. So, animals or organisms with eukaryotic cells include the plants, animals, and fungi. So these are the two types of cells, the prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells. The prokaryotic cells are simple cells and their organization is fundamentally similar. They are small cells which are surrounded by a membrane and they are enclosed within a rigid cell wall. They do not have interior compartments. Most prokaryotic cells are enclosed by a strong cell wall which is composed of peptidoglycan. The bacteria may be classified into two types based on the differences in the cell wall as detected by the gram staining procedures. So based on the gram staining, staining procedures, we have two types of bacteria. These are gram positive bacteria. This, they retain a growth stain within the cell, causing it to appear purple under the microscope. And another type of bacteria is from negative bacteria. In this bacteria, they have a multi-layer wall which does not retain the stain. So based on the gram staining procedure, we have two types of bacteria. The gram positive bacteria, which retain the stain, and the gram negative bacteria, which do not retain the stain. So the susceptibility of bacteria to antibiotics often depends on their structure of their cell wall. Characteristics of prokaryotic cells. They have simple internal organization. They have few internal compartments. Most prokaryotes have no membrane bound organism. They do not have true nucleus, and also they have one chromosome and a simple circular DNA. Some prokaryotes also have a flagella. Here is the generalized structure of a prokaryotic cell, and it has structures such as a flagellum, the capsule, the cell wall, plasma membrane, the fimbria, cytosol, ribosomes, DNA strand in nuclei and plasma. So we are not going to discuss in detail the the functions of the, the 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 functions of these parts of the prokaryotic cells because we we'll discuss it later on. Eukaryotic cells. Uh, these cells are more complex than a prokaryotic cells. They have internal compartmentalization. They contain numerous organelles, unlike the prokaryotes, prokaryotic cells. Also, they have membrane-bound structures which close off the compartment. So, different biochemical processes can occur simultaneously and independently. So, the, the, the membrane-bound structures allow biochemical reactions or processes to occur without interaction, so they can occur simultaneously and independently. So here is the generalized structure of a eukaryotic cell, and we have parts such as the cell membrane, 
the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. It provides the cell with energy. It is the source of energy. The lysosomes, the nuclear membrane. Also, another part is the central. We have the Golgi apparatus, the fat droplet, nucleolus, and the nucleus. So this is the generalized structure of a eukaryotic cell. Then we move to cell organelles. The first one is nucleus. Nucleus is the storehouse of genetic information that directs all the activities of a living eukaryotic cell. So the nucleus is only found in eukaryotic cells and it is the one that controls all the activities of a cell in eukaryotic organisms. Another organelle is the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope has nuclear pores which are filled with proteins and these they act as the molecular channels and therefore permitting certain molecules to pass in, into and out of the nucleus. Another other layer is the chromosomes. Chromosomes are found in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So inside the chromosomes there is a DNA which contains hereditary information which specifies the cell structure and function. Another part is endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is composed of a lipid bilayer which is embedded with proteins. So the endoplasmic reticulum is also divided into two parts. There is smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is embedded with numerous ribosomes, and that's why it is called rough endoplasmic reticulum. But the smooth endoplasmic reticulum has fewer ribosomes and it Helps, it contains enzymes which help to catalyze the breakdown of lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. So another cell organ there is the body apparatus. This is also called the cell delivery system because it transports materials from one part of the cell to another part within the cell. Also, Another part is the lysosomes, which catalyze the breakdown of proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates. Another part is ribosomes. These are sites of protein synthesis. So protein is synthesized in the ribosomes. Also the centrioles, which are microtubules, are stainless centers. The microtubules are assembled in the centrioles. Also, the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton provides the framework of the cell. So these are the functions of the different cell organs. Some of them are found in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Others are found in only eukaryotic cells, while others are only found in prokaryotic cells. So this is the functions of the cell organs. Then we move to viruses. Let's see the characteristics of the viruses. Why are viruses considered and are not considered living? Viruses are not considered to be living organisms because they cannot reproduce independently. So viruses cannot reproduce on their own until they infect the cell of their host. So they can only replicate by gaining entry into a cell using the cell machinery. And because of their disease causing potential, viruses are very important biological entities. So there are different diseases that are caused by viruses. For example, AIDS, this is acquired immunodeficient syndrome, also polio, which causes the paralysis of different body organs. Normally the legs and the, the, the limbs, flu and other human and plant diseases. So there are a lot of diseases that are caused by viruses. And because of their disease causing potential, and also because they, they, they reproduce in large numbers 
once they infect the cell of the host, and that's why they are very important to biologists when they are not considered the living organism. So, characteristics of the viruses. The first one is that viruses are made of RNA or DNA, which is surrounded by a protein coat. The individual carrying the viruses contain only a single type of nucleic acid. It is either DNA or RNA, but they do not contain both RNA and DNA. Many viruses form an envelope around the capsid rich protein, lipids and glycoprotein molecules. They are able to reproduce because they carry genes that are translated to proteins by cell genetic machinery. Also, viruses, they lack ribosomes and all agents for protein synthesis and energy metabolism. Now, why do scientists study viruses? Scientists study viruses because their structure is simple. Also, they, the, the large numbers that are produced in an infection cell. So once they infect a cell, they will produce in large numbers and that's why are of very interest to scientists. Also, due to the fact that their genes are related to the genes of their host. So the genes of the viruses relate to the host which they inhabit. The structure of the viruses. Viruses, the simple viruses have a single molecule of nucleic acid, which is surrounded by a capsid, which is made up of one to few different kinds of protein molecules. Complex viruses have kinds of molecules of either DNA or RNA in each virus particle and many different kinds of protein molecules. So the characteristics, they have rod-like or thread-like appearance. Isometric viruses have roughly spherical shape. Most viruses are icosahedral in basic structure. Then we move to bacterial stage. These are viruses that infect the bacteria. And they are diverse in structure and function. They, they differ. There is, they, they differ in structure and function. They can be found only in bacterial host. So that's why they are called bacteriophage. They can only be found in bacterial host. Many are large and complex with relatively large amount of DNA and protein. Some of them have been named as the members of T series. The T series bacteriophage are virulent viruses which must fly within infected cells and eventually causing them to rupture. So diseases which are caused by viruses, the smallpox, infectious hepatitis, yellow fever, polio, rabies. Rabies this is affect the dogs, but also it can affect the humans once they are bitten by dogs, and also AIDS. And also viruses, they cause major losses in agriculture, forest and in productivity of the natural ecosystem. So viruses cause great damage to both humans, other organisms, in plants and also in the natural ecosystem. So another group is bacteria. Bacteria are simple organisms that live on Earth today. They are the most abundant of all organisms to evolve on Earth. They are most abundant because they can be found in all types of habitats. They can be found in water, in the, in the air, in the soil. In all kinds of habitats, we can find bacteria. So they are the most abundant organisms that live on Earth. They are too small to be seen with unaided eyes. You cannot see the bacteria with our eyes, unaided eyes. The only organisms that are characterized by a prokaryotic cellular organization. So these are the only organisms that have prokaryotic cells, and that's why they are called prokaryotes. The life on Earth would not have evolved without the bacteria. Remember when we were discussing the 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 the, 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 the first video on 
bacteria, the alpha bacteria, which were the unusual bacteria, which were able to inhabit the air. The earliest earth has uh, unseparable characteristics, for example, high temperature and low oxygen. So the unusual bacteria were the first one to occupy the air. But then, after the alpha bacteria, the new bacteria then inhabited the air. The new bacteria carried out the process of photosynthesis, where a process where they can make their own food. So after photosynthesis, the oxygen is produced as a byproduct. So the new bacteria, when they inhabited, they, they inhabited the air, they played a decisive role of increasing the oxygen concentration from below 1%, which was present when the alpha bacteria were the only organisms on air. So they increased the oxygen concentration from below 1% to the current level, which is 21% in the atmosphere. So because of the oxygen that was created by the photosynthetic activities of the true bacteria, now other organisms could inhabit the air because most organisms require oxygen for their survival. And that's why life on air could not have evolved without the bacteria. So we move to the differences between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So when we look at the multicellularity, the prokaryotes are unicellular. That means they have only one cell. That means they are all of their life processes occur inside a single cell. While the eukaryotes are multicellular, that means they have many cells which have been specialized to perform different functions. But also when we look at their cell size, the prokaryotes have their cells are one micrometer or less in diameter, while that of the eukaryotes is over ten times the size of the prokaryotic cells. Then the chromosomes. The chromosomes of the prokaryotes do not have membrane bound organelles, but the chromosomes of the eukaryotes have membrane bound organelles. And also the chromosomes have naked cyclic DNA which is localized in the zone of cytoplasm which is called the nucleoid. While the chromosomes of the eukaryotes contain a made up of nucleic acids and protein. Also, when we look at the cell division and genetic recombination, in prokaryotes cell division is by binary fission, while in eukaryotes the cell is defined by mitosis and it involves the spinous. The prokaryotes, they lack sexual reproduction, while in eukaryotes, the sexual reproduction occurs and it involves single and meiosis with alternation of the haploid and diploid forms. Also, in prokaryotes, they, they have a certain mechanism that leads to the transfer of the genetic material. Then when we move to another feature, which is internal compartmentalization, in prokaryotes, the cytoplasm of bacteria does not contain internal compartments or cytoskeleton and do not have organelles except the ribosomes. While in eukaryotes, they, are, they have internal compartmentalization. Also, another feature is flagella. The flagella of prokaryotes is simple, while which the flagella which is found in eukaryotes is complex. Then we move to the shapes of bacteria. So these are bacterial cell shapes. This is round or cold. So these are called round bacteria, and these are they have rod shape and therefore they are called rod or bacilli. And also the spiral or spirilli, they have spiral shape. 
and also the coma or the vibrios. A good example is the bacteria which is called the vibrio cholerae, the one that causes cholera. A filamentous, filamental, which has its shape is like filament. And here is the bacterial cell arrangement, the diplococci, which means dialysis too, streptococci and staphylococci. So these are the bacterial cell, cell shapes and bacterial cell arrangement. The economic importance of bacteria. Bacteria cause diseases to plants and animals, but also in human beings. They also fix nitrogen and make it available for organisms to use. So they fix nitrogen and make it available for use to, to organisms. They are also used in various industrial processes, for example, production of cheese, yogurt, vinegar, and many other industrial processes. Also, many bacteria, many antibiotics are derived from bacteria, for example, streptomycin and chloromycetin. These are antibiotics which are being derived from certain bacteria. Then we move to another group, the fungi. The fungi were traditionally included in the plant kingdom. However, they only resemble plants in the following ways. First is their general appearance. Some fungus look like the plants and due to the fact that they lack mobility, just like the plants. So because of these two ways, which they resemble to plants, they were included in the plant kingdom. However, the fungi contain most of the characteristics of features which are very different from plants. So let's see the differences between the fungi and the plants. Fungi are heterotrophs, that means they cannot make their own food. They depend on other organisms for food. And normally the fungus feed on dead or decaying matter. Plants are autotrophs. They have self-feeding mechanism. They carry out the process of photosynthesis. So they make their own food. Also, another difference is that they have non-motile spans. The, the, the spans of the fungi are non-motile. They cannot move. But some plants have motile spans with flagella. For example, we are discussing the seedless vascular plants. For example, the fan. So the, the spans of the fan are flagellated and therefore they can swim in a field of water to reach the egg. Also, another difference is that the cell wall is made up of chitin, while the cell wall of the plant is made up of cellulose. Then we move to genetics. So we cannot talk about genetics without acknowledging the father of genetics, the Australian monk who was named Gregory Mendel. So Gregory Mendel is called, is referred to as the father of genetics because he studied different plants, the garden trees, and therefore he came up with a certain laws of heredity and inheritance. So let's begin. The stages of the Mendel experiment. So Mendel conducted his experiments in three stages. These are first he allowed the peer plants of a given variety to produce progeny by self-fertilization for several generations. So the peer plants, the peer plants with white flower, for example, we are crossed with each other to produce offspring with white flowers, regardless the numbers of generations. So in the first stage, Mendel cross-pollinated the offspring with white flowers. So he obtained the same results generation after generations because the white, the, the bee plants that produce white flowers were cross-pollinated with the bee plants that produce white flowers. So 
he obtained the term for that generation after generation. So this was the first stage of the Mendel experiment. Then, in the second stage, Mendel performed crosses between varieties exhibiting alternative forms of the trait. So, for example, he removed the male parts from the flower of the plant that produce white flowers and fertilized it with the pollen from a purple flowered plant. So, also, Mendel was successful in his experiment because he used pairs of contrasting traits. For example, when the trait that was being investigated was the color of the flower, Mendel chose the flower that produced purple and white. So, in the second stage, Mendel used alternative forms of the trait. So, he cross pollinated the plants, pear plants that produce white flower with the pear plants that produce purple flower. He also carried out reciprocal crosses using the pollen from white flower individual to fertilize the flowers or the pear plant that produce white flowers. So that was the second stage of the Mendel experiment. And finally, Mendel permitted the hybrid of offspring produced by these crosses to self-pollinate for several generations. So by doing so, he allowed alternative forms of the trait to segregate among them progeny. So then he counted the number of offspring of each type in each succeeding generation. So no other scientist has ever done that before. So Mendel was the first scientist to carry out these experiments in a series of stages. So the quantitative results that Mendel obtained proved to be of supreme importance in revealing the, the, the process of heredity. So Mendel referred to the trait in the first filial generation plant as dominant and to the to the alternative forms that was not expressed in the F1 plant are recessive. So when he cross pollinated the white flowered plant to the purple flowered plant and all the offspring in the first filial generations were purple, they, they produce purple flower, he turned the trait which is the purple flowered plant as dominant and the alternative forms which was not expressed in the first filial generation plant as recessive. So, after the cross pollination between the white flowered plants and the purple flowered plants, the purple flowered plants were dominant because they mark the appearance of the other trait, which is the white plant. So, the, the white flowered plants were termed recessive because they could not be expressed in the first filial generation. So for each of the seven pairs of contrasting forms of the trait that Mendel examined, one of the pairs proved to be dominant and the other recessive. So he continued to obtain the same results even for the remaining crosses between of different traits. So after allowing individuals in the first period generation plants to mature and self-pollinate, Mendel Collected, the plant, collected and planted the seeds from each plant to see what the offspring in the second filial generation would look like. So he found out that some second filial generation plants exhibited white flowers and the recessive form exhibited the white flowers which is the recessive forms of the trait. So the, the, the trait which could not be expressed in the first filial generation appeared in the second filial generation, the white flower plant, which is the recessive trait. So latent in the first filial generation, the recessive forms reappeared among the second filial generation individuals. So believing the proportions of the second filial generation types would provide some clue about the mechanism of heredity, Mendel counted the number of each type among the second filial generation project. So three quarters of the second filial generation individuals exhibited the dominant form of the trait, which are the purple flowers. 
and one quarter displays the receptive forms, which is the white flower plant. So the the, the ratio, the, the the dominant form of the page contains three quarters of the individuals in the second period generation, and the recessive forms contain one quarter of the individuals in the second period generation. So, in other words, the dominant recessive ratio among the second period plant was always close to ratio three to one. So that that means three ratio three is for dominant and one stands for the recessive ratio three to one. So Mendel carried out similar experiments with other trees such as wrinkled seeds, vessels round, and he obtained similar results. So he performed several experiments using different trees, and the results remain the same. Then we move to Mendel's model of heredity. Mendel's model of heredity has five elements. The first one, parents do not transmit physiological traits directly to their offspring. Rather, they transmit separate information about the traits, what Mendel called factor. So this separate information of the traits, Mendel called them factors. And these factors later act in the offspring to produce the trait. The second element is each individual receives two factors that may call for the same form or for two alternative forms of the trait. So each individual is diploid. When the individual form gamete, that means egg or sperm, they contain only one of each kind of chromosomes. And the gametes are haploid. Therefore, only one factor of each trait of the adult organism is contained in the gamete. So to elaborate what it means here in the second element of the Mendel's model of heredity, it means that where an organism is diploid, in sexually reproducing organisms are diploid. That means when they form gametes, be it egg or sperm, they contain only one kind of each chromosome. And therefore, during sexual intercourse, a male parent contributes half of the characteristic to the offspring. And the female parent also contributes half of the characteristic to, to the offspring. And therefore, a resultant offspring is diploid. That means it has certain, certain traits that it inherited from the male parent and another set of the characteristics from the female parents. So the second element suggests that not all copies of a factor are identical. So not all factors are identical. In modern terms, the alternative forms of a factor leading to the alternative forms of a trait are called alleles. So they are a different alleles. For example, if you are talking about the trait, maybe it is we are looking at the trait which is the head of a plant. Some of the real plants that were, were produced, which were studied by Mendes, were short, others were tall. So there are two alleles. One which determines the shortness, and another alley which determines the tallness in an individual. So when two haploid gametes containing exactly the same alley or the factor fused during fertilization to form a zygote, the offspring that develops from that from that zygote is said to be homozygous. That means if a whole, if uh, an offspring has received the same the same factor that determines a trait from both a male and a female parent, then an, organ, uh, an, an organism or a resultant offspring is then homozygous because it has two identical factors or two identical alleles. And because the, the trait is, is, the trait which is, the, is, is expressed in an offspring is influenced by the same type or the same type of factors, then it is called homozygous because homo means same. 
So when two haploid gametes contain different RNAs, then the individual offspring will tend to be heterozygous. Heterozygous means that an individual contains two different RNAs of the same that contains a trait. So for example, if we are talking about the trait, maybe it is H, then it contains both two RNAs, one for shortness and another for tallness, and that's why it is called heterozygous. So in one intent, the membrane factors are called genes. So what membrane called factors are what we call genes, and genes control all the traits in an organism. And the alternative forms of the same genes are called RNAs. The two RNAs, one contributed by the male gamete and one which is contributed by a female gamete, do not influence each other in any way. So they remain separate. Thus, when an individual matures and produces, when the individual matures and produces its own gametes, the RNAs for each gene segregate randomly into this gene gamete. So the genes that an individual has are referred to as its genotype. So the genotype is the genetic makeup of an individual, while the outward appearance of the individual is referred to as the phenotype. So phenotype is the outward appearance of the individuals. Then we move to the first law of heredity, which is also called the law of segregation. So the mother's models account in a net and satisfying way for the segregation ratios he observed. Its central assumptions is that alternative areas of traits segregate from each other in heterozygous individuals and remain distinct has since been verified in many other organisms. So it is commonly referred to as Mendel's first law of heredity or the laws of segregation. The, the first law of heredity or the law of segregation. The, the Mendel's model does account in a net and satisfying way for the segregation ratios he observed. And the central assumption was that the alternative elements of the trait segregate from each other in heterozygous individuals and remain distinct. So in heterozygous individual is the individual that contain two alternative forms of the same gene. That means if we are talking about maybe the color, the, the color of the the color of the flower, so it means if an organism is heterozygous for, for, for the trait, it means it has two alleles. One that is for purple and another which is for white. So the alternative alleles of the trait segregate in each other in heterozygous individuals and remain distinct. So this has been verified in many other organisms. So what Mendel has discovered using the pear plant but the same has been observed in other organisms that were studied by other scientists after the experiments of the Gregory Mendel. So it is commonly referred to as the Mendel's first law of heredity, or sometimes called the law of segregation. Then we move to Mendel's second law of heredity. So when two genes are located on different chromosomes, the RNAs included in an individual garment are distributed at random. The RNA for one gene included in the garment has no influence on which RNA of each other gene is included in the garment. So such genes are said to be to assort independently. And the Mendel's second law of heredity is also called the law of independent assortment because the one gene to be included, the RNA for one gene to be included does not influence which RNA of the other genes to be included in the gametes. And this law is called the law of independent assortment or the second law of heredity. The effects of the environment of the genesis. The nutrition RNA is expressed the effect of the environment. Some RNA is Sensitive, for example, 
traits which are the first time such allies are more sensitive to temperature or light than are the products of other allies. For example, the Arctic forces. For, for example, the Arctic forces, they make far windows only when the conditions are warm. Similarly, the Himalayan rabbits and the Sydney's cats, they are they have certain animals which are influenced by temperature. So to conclude, the environment has an effect on the expression to the degree in which um, an animal is expressed. So this is the end of the video. Thank you for watching.